Philippians chapter 3. You know, last Sunday I did kind of like an Independence Day sermon because Thursday was Independence Day, July 4th. And uh, I got clean by and decided I'd do another. Uh, but this one's not really an Independence Day sermon, okay? Uh, this is more of a Dependence Day sermon. The older I get, the more I realize how dependent I am on God for everything. And you know what? We have forgotten how dependent we are on God, and that's what I want to talk about today, and I think Paul does that. But you know, uh, it seems like in our country, y'all know this, in the last few years, you know, the Supreme Court said that... Uh, that we had to take the Ten Commandments down, down out of every public building. We couldn't have anything in the public that said anything about God. Couldn't have the Ten Commandments in any government building. I was really distressed by the fact that they said you can't have them in the school. Let's just brainwash the youngins and tell them they ain't a God and all that's just hogwash, okay? They're winning. They're winning. Okay? Okay. Uh, Look, they wanted to take Ten Commandments out of school. They wanted to take mention of God out of school. I'm old. I know it. But you know, when I went to school, every morning, when we got to school, the loudspeaker would come on. We'd stand up. We'd say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We'd recite the Lord's Prayer. And you know what? When I was in grade school in South Georgia, the principal would get on the intercom and pray. They need to be doing that now. But they've taken God out of the schools. They took the Ten Commandments out of the schools. They took the Ten Commandments. They said, you can't have a, a plaque with the Ten Commandments in any government building. Now, I stopped thinking about this. I think probably Sean's thought about it before. They took them out of the courthouse. Our whole legal system is built on the Ten Commandments. You know, Jesus said something in his word about building a house, didn't he? And he said, you know, there's two men built houses. One of them built his house on the scene. Another one built a strong foundation. And here's the thing. The whole point of that story is, if you take the foundation away, the building falls. It works that way with countries as well. Our country was founded upon God and His Word. And everybody out there, ACLU, you ever thought about that? American Civil Liberties Union. Now that sounds good, don't it? You ever read their charter? They tell you we are a communist organization. They are the sworn enemy of democracy in the United States, and we just want to do what we want to. You know, I, I, I seem like I remember reading something where not too long ago that if you were a traitor, if you were treasonous, the penalty for that was kind of on the stiff side. They lined you up against the wall and shot you. <coughs> Folks, listen. We got everybody trying to tear the foundation right out from under our country. We declared our independence from England back in 1776. Okay? We said we are independent, we are free, we are our own nation, and that was a good thing, okay? But now we need to go back and do a, de uh, a declaration of dependence on God in this country. That's what we need to do. We need to put God back. And people say, oh, no, man, our founding fathers, they, they, they didn't think about God. They didn't do it. Hmm. Let me, I had to look these up, but let me, look these, let me read these to you. I didn't want to miss court. Okay? In 1789, George Washington. That name ring a bell? Do they still teach that in school? I'm sorry. George Washington in 1789 said this, It is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. Sound my, uh, I don't know about you, but it sounds like he's talking about God to me. He said it's the duty of every nation to do that. Almost 100 years later, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln said this. It is the duty. You know how they start the same way, didn't they? It is the duty, okay, of nations as well as men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God. 
to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. These were presidents of the United States. I ain't never heard Biden say anything like that. In fact, I can't make any sense of anything. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I don't know. Thomas Jefferson said this, and can, this is a question, he's asking a question, he's kind of approaching this differently than, than Lincoln and Washington, he said, and can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are the gift of God? In other words, hey, it, can we keep our liberty? Can we keep our freedom if the people aren't thinking that those liberties are a gift of God? That's what he was saying. He goes on. That they are not to be violated but with His wrath. In other words, if you forget God, judgment's come. Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that His justice is cannot sleep forever. Let me tell you something. You can say all you want to about our founding fathers not facing things on the Word of God. You're wrong. <coughs> they did. And I've heard all kinds of stuff about that. Folks, let me tell you something. We need to go back to thinking like they thought in this country. And you know what? Thomas Jefferson said it right. He said, in the minds of the people. Folks, let me tell you something. That's where it starts. It starts with individuals. It starts in the minds and in the hearts of individuals. And I know I've been talking about our country and our political freedom, but let me tell you something. If it's going to get into the mind of the people, it has to start with the Word of God. Because it has to happen when the people decide that we're going to get back to God. And that's what we need to do. And that's why I'm saying today that we need to declare our dependence upon God to, create, to heal our country and to heal us as well. Folks, let me tell you something. I said this last week. Our freedom or independence can only be kept by declaring our dependence on God. Our liberty, our freedom can only be kept when we declare our dependence upon God. And Paul was talking to the church at Philippi in chapter 3, which I'm going to get to the Scripture, uh, and he was talking about their freedom in Christ had to be dependent upon Christ. Everything depended upon Christ. That's what he was talking about. But there were people that had come in, okay? We've talked about them before. They were called Judaizers. These were people who said, okay, you can be a Christian, but you got to keep the rituals of the Jewish faith. you got to go through all the, the rites and the rituals, and you got to keep the holidays, and you got to do all you got to do this Jewish thing in able to be a Christian. Paul didn't agree. Paul said, no, you need to watch out for that. See, these were legalistic people. These were people who came along, and they put a bunch of man-made rules in front of people and said, if you really want to be saved, if you really want to be a Christian, you have to follow these rules. Paul didn't have anything good to say about these people. Okay? He said he called them dogs. That's pretty bad. He called them evil. He called them mutilators. He, boy, he didn't pull any punches. He was telling the church at Philippi exactly what he thought about these Judaizers. He said, your worship of God does not depend on rituals and man-made laws. It depends on your heart and the Spirit of God. Amen. That's what it depends on. Nothing else. And he uses himself as an example. Now he approaches this thing and he said, we need to depend on God and not all these other things. And he uses his own life as an example. And he says, here's what we don't need to depend on. 
And I'm going to read this to you, and then we're going to talk about it for just a minute. And you read along with me. Stand as we read in Philippians chapter 3. We'll start with verse 2. Now remember, he's talking about these Judaizers. He says this, Beware of dogs. <laughs> he's talking about Judaizers. He said their character is like that of a dog. He says, beware of evil workers. He says that their conduct is evil because they were pulling people away from God. And he says, uh, beware of the concision. Now he's talking about the Jewish rite or ritual of circumcision. And he said that their conduct or their creed was that of mutilation. He was talking about mutilation of the flesh and circumcision and things like that. But he had nothing good to say about these people. In verse 3 he says, For we are of the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. You know what he was saying? He was saying this. He was saying, look, I don't trust in the flesh, but those people that think that they've done a lot of stuff that's going to get them to heaven, he said, I got more to brag about than they do. But I don't trust in any of them. That's where he goes with it. Let's go on. He said and he's talking about himself here starting in verse 5. He said, Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made comfortable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the re resurrection of the dead. You know what? Paul's laying it on the line right here, and I think we're all listening. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this time. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move and work. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be glorified in all things. Lord, in your name we pray. Listen. Paul uses his own life as an example and he gives us examples of things that we don't need to depend on. The first thing he was talking about, and this goes back to those Judaizers, he was addressing those people that he, he said are trying to take you away from Christ. The first thing he says that you don't need to depend on is religious ritual. That's what he's talking about there in verse 5. He says, circumcise the eighth day to stop of Israel. Okay? Circumcision was a Jewish thing. They said, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to be circumcised. Folks, let me tell you something. <laughs> when Christ came and died on that cross, all that stuff don't matter anymore because Christ became our salvation. Faith in Jesus Christ is what matters. And Paul said, don't let these people make you think that you've got to keep all these rituals so that you can be saved. But there are people that even today, you know, he goes with the circumcision thing because it was commanded by Moses in the Old Testament. And that's what these people were hanging on to. But, but folks, he said, ritual will not save you. What ritual do we hang on to today? And do you think they're going to save you? Stop and think about it. You look right here. We've got the table. We're going we're gonna to observe communion. The Lord's Supper here in just, uh, in just a little bit. I started to say in just a few minutes, but it might be longer than that. Look, it, you know, this is valuable. This has value. This is important. We need to do it because God said we need to remember His death until He comes. Okay? But that won't save you. You know, you stop and think about the brothers in the Catholic faith, you know? And I, I had a, a fellow that I worked with in, in, in one of Rivals, and I love him to death to this day, man. I mean, he, he's my brother. And, uh, and you know, he, he was Catholic. And I said, you know, do you go to church? He said, yeah, I go every Sunday. I go to Mass. I said, okay. I said, you take communion? He said, oh, yeah, I take communion. I said, you say because taking Lord's Supper won't save you. 
I think it's important for us to observe the Lord's Supper, but have one soon. Baptism. You know, you ask somebody, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I was baptized when I was a kid. I didn't ask you if you were baptized. I asked you, are you a Christian? Hey, have you been saved? Because you know what? If going up there and getting dunked in that pool saved you, I get saved every morning when I get up and take a shower. It's just sprinkling instead of dunking. But, you know, I mean, hey, it's, you know, all you're doing up there is getting wet. Now, you are following Christ in obedience because He said we ought to be baptized to tell everybody that we now are new in Christ. But, folks, baptism doesn't save you. You know, thief on the cross didn't have time to be baptized, but I guarantee you he's with Jesus right now. Amen. That don't save you. That's a ritual that we go through, but it doesn't save us. Folks, I, you know, I ask people again, hey, are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, I remember down there at this church. I didn't ask you if you remember the church. I asked you, are you a Christian? Have you been saved? You know, y'all probably going to get on to me for this. But I have talked to a lot of people since I've been here and asked them to come to church. And you know, they said, yeah, well, it's your job to go want people to join the church. I said, did you hear me say I want you to join the church? I said, let me tell you something. I want you to come to church. I didn't say anything about joining. I said, to be honest with you, I don't care if you join or not as long as you're coming. Now, would I like you to join? Absolutely. We want as many people as we can get because we got a good church and everybody's friendly and just a big family. And we'd love for you to be part of that. But you know what? Just because you come to church, that don't say you ought to come to church. I'm begging people to come to church. But folks, church membership won't save you. You know, and I could go on and on and on. You know, people, you know, I ask people, are you saved? Well, you know, you go to church, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Whatever. Well, you know, I just don't go to church much. I don't believe much in going to church, but I, I give money to them. God don't need your money, do you? <coughs> ask people are Christian. Oh, yeah, I tithe every Sunday. I didn't ask you that. I don't care about your tithe. That's between you and God. What I want to know about is how is your soul? That's what's important. Folks, let me tell you something. All of these things have value, but Paul says they will not save you. And he said, look, I've been through the ritual, but that didn't save you. We can't depend on the ritual. We also can't depend on the family tree, the genealogy. You know, my wife has done a lot of deal. She knows more about my family than I do. I wish I didn't know as much about my family. Joshua called me one day because he's in that stuff and he, he does it on purpose. He called me one day. He said, you know, I'm looking at this and I've read a lot of stuff about the will come in. And I said, oh, my story. Yeah. He said, Wilcox men were known for three things. I said, oh, I don't want to ask. I don't want to know. He said, well, the first one was preaching. I said, you got to be kidding. Oh, I thought my daddy was the first one. Apparently I was wrong. I said, well, that ain't so bad if they were preaching the right things. He said, yeah, they know for being preaching. He said, the second thing they were known for was fighting. <laughs> I said, that one don't surprise me a bit. I mean, stop thinking about it. How many Wilcox men? I mean, he likes to do research on all the Wilcox men that fought the Civil War, World War I, World War II. I mean, we had a reputation. I mean, we were down here fighting the Indians before it was named Wilcox County. They like to fight. And I mean, even me and my boys, we police. You got to fight a few police. And I'll be honest with you, there's a few of them I really enjoy. You know, we were talking about it this morning. Everybody blames their own sin on everything else. I used to go to college, especially the message. They, you know, I've heard it more than once. They say, you know what? She just kept running her mouth. I told her to be quiet, and she kept on and kept on. And man, I finally had enough. I just snapped. I, it ain't my fault. It's her fault. And I almost got in trouble about this, but I looked at him one day and I said, you know what? You keep running your mouth, and I'm just gonna snap, and you can't blame me for it. <laughs> Still in the but look, we, we, we all try to blame our sin on something else, don't we? We try to blame it on everybody else. And let me tell you something. Oh, I forgot. I ain't going to tell you what the third thing was. <laughs> I ain't proud of it. But it did have to do something with women. Okay? 
just say that. I, that's what the Wilcox meant. And Joshua loved that. He just loved telling me that. I said, why you got to tell me this stuff? I didn't want to know that. When you start, yeah, right. Well, yeah, if you've been around Wilcox County, you knew it. I mean, I, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm trying to do everything I can to improve our reputation, okay? Uh, but anyway, you, you know, you, you, and people think that just because their daddy was a Christian, that's going to get them into heaven. And Paul looked at his family tree and said, look, I am of the people of Israel. Now, when he said that, he wasn't talking about the Jewish nation. He was talking about the Israelites. You know which one were really, quote unquote, in their hearts, true Israelites? The ones descended from Jacob. Because Jacob, remember Jacob? He was the one that tricked his, his way into the birthright. And God changed his name from Jacob to what? Israel. Israel. And he said, look, I am an Israelite. I am descended from Jacob. That carried prestige, okay? He said, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. That was prestigious. You know the tribe of Benjamin? The very first king of Israel was a Benjamite, Saul. He started out all right. Didn't end up too good. But he started out all right. But not only that, back, you know, when, uh, when Solomon died, he had two sons, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. You know, one of them took the south southern kingdom, another one took the northern kingdom. One of them did evil inside the Lord, but Rehoboam did good inside the Lord. And the Benjamites, where'd they stay? They stayed with Rehoboam. They did the right thing. Their family, his family, he would, he would say, look, I, I got a good family. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I got a great heritage. But none of that will save you. And there's people saying, oh, boy, my family's been going to this church for 150 years. Well, that's good. There's a lot of them out there in the cemetery. Yeah, oh, yeah. I see people all over the place. Last time I went to the mountains, man, look at my truck. Said, you can look out there. I don't feel good. I mean, I'm in North Georgia. Man, I saw my truck there. Hey, you know, he said, now you spend two weeks during the summer in Russia. It's just like, oh, these people, everybody knows. He said, do you know where Union Baptist Church is? I said, yeah. I had told him who it was, yeah. I said, yeah, I know where it is. He said, do you know anybody that goes there? I said, one or two. <laughs> he said, do you live near there? I said, two miles from the church. He said, really? I said, yeah, right here, Peter. I said, that's what it is. He said, well, who do you know that goes to church? And I started listening. He said, you know more than one or two. How do you know all them people? I said, I'm the preacher at Union Baptist Church. He went, well, that would explain it. And he got to talk about his family. You know, we do that. We talk about our families. How, oh, my family's been members of that church for a hundred and something years. Folks, let me tell you something. It might have been good for them, but if you hadn't made a decision for Jesus Christ, them being Christians ain't going to help you a bit. Paul said, we can't depend on our family to get us in on our coattails. But he had bragging rights when he came to be, of being an Israelite and of the tribe of Jacob and of the Benjamites. And, you know, I mean, he had it all as far as that went. He said, you know what? There's another thing you can't worry about is that your position. He was pretty prestigious in the religious group in Israel at the time before he became a Christian okay first of all he says I was a Pharisee you know what that's something he didn't brag much about after he got to, became a Christian he was a Pharisee that was the strictest sect of Judaism you know what we would call them today they were the most conservative they were the most conservative they were also the most wrong but they were conservative it says he was even trained by Gamaliel. Gamaliel, even to this day among Orthodox Jews, is considered one of the greatest teachers in Israel's history. And Paul studied under Gamaliel. He had a very high position. He had a high position in the religious authority. He had a high position in the nation of Israel. But he said that don't mean a thing because it won't get you into heaven. And my question this morning, are you, are you depending your, upon your status or position in the church to see? Because it won't. Only Christ can do that. He goes on and he says, don't depend on your accomplishment. He, 
He had a lot of confidence. Now, when, when we read these accomplishments, we think, oh, that's bad. But in his day, among Orthodox Jews, this was a good thing. Okay? What was he doing? He was persecuting churches. He was tracking down Christians because he thought they were wrong. He was tracking them down. And he was arresting them. And he was putting them to death. You know who one of the first evangelists was? It was a young man named Stephen. And it says that they stoned Stephen for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while they were stoning them, there was a guy standing there holding their coats. And his name was Saul, but he later became known as Paul. He was the one that actually put Stephen to death because he was the one that had the authority to do it. He said, oh, i got all these confidence that I can talk about. I've put them to death left and right. But you know what the Bible says? It says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags before God. There's nothing we can do. Our accomplishments, and you may accomplish great things in your life, but those accomplishments won't get you to heaven. You can't rely on your accomplishments. You know what? I, I'm looking for, I'm reading all the time. And I, 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 sometimes the Lord will say, hey, you might better hang on to that. And I was reading, of course, I, you know, I like sports, and so I was reading a story about a guy uh, years ago that used to be the basketball coach at LaSalle University. And his name was Speedy Mars. That's what they called him, Speedy Mars. And uh, he went to LaSalle as the head coach, and he started having, you know, a little success there. And so he was uh, he was upstairs shaving one day, and uh, he heard the phone ring, and he heard his wife answer it, and she came to the top of the stairs and said, "Honey, you have a phone call." And he just shaved away, and uh, and she said, "Well, who?" Who is it from? And he, she said, it's Sports Illustrated. He got so excited he cut himself. He thought, wait a minute, I'm finally getting some national recognition. Sports Illustrated has called me. And he took off and he dropped his razor and now he's bleeding from his face and he's still got the shaving cream on. He looks like a mess. He gets to the top of the stairs, starts down, falls down the stairs, nearly breaks a leg. He finally gets up and I mean, he's just limping and he's hurting and everything, but he finally gets to the phone. He's so excited that Sports Illustrated wants to talk to him. And he grabs the phone and composes himself and says, this is Coach Mark. And the guy on the other line said, sir, for 75 cents an issue, you can get a one-year subscription. <laughs> he was quite disappointed. But you know what? That's the way our accomplishments are. You know, Winston Churchill, I remember reading a story about him where a reporter got an interview with him and, and <clears> looked at uh, Sir, Ch uh, Sir Winston Churchill and said, Sir, he said, it must thrill you when you give a speech to see that the hall is crowded to overflowing with people. He said, that is a bit, uh, that is a bit flattering, he said, but just remember this, if they were hanging me to Christ, the crowd would be quite as big. <laughs> You know, people say, if I put the number out of the TV right there and mention your name, what am I going to hear? I said, Peter Fleet. You know what? We read history books. Do you really know if that's correct or not? Because it all depends on who wrote the book. Folks, let me tell you something. Whatever accomplishments we may have or may not have, they don't mean nothing when it comes to that. Let me tell you something. The only thing that we have to boast about is that God said That's the only thing we have to boast about. We don't have anything to boast about. We don't have anything to glory. Folks, your accomplishments won't save you. We must declare our dependence on Christ. But let me real quick tell you what dependence on Christ will do for you, okay? It will give you a new perspective. If you look at the life of Paul, when Paul got saved, his whole world view changed, okay? Everything that he considered profit, he says this right there. He said, yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. He said, look, all of those stuff don't matter. The only thing that matters is that Jesus is my Lord. 
That's what matters. And he's talking about it in the sense of a, a ledger, a financial ledger. He said, all these things that I had on the credit side, oh, they got moved to the loss side because I lost it all. I lost it all. And I'm glad because I lost it for something that was worth something. Folks, let me tell you something. When it talks about this loss right here, and I had to look at something because I hate English. Y'all know that. But it's written in the, how do you say it, aorist or aorist sense? Tense. I, don't, I can't remember. It's one intense. But anyway, it means this. It points to a definite time. Okay, it points to a definite time. When he said, I lost it all, he lost it all at one time. In one moment, he lost it all. You know when that moment was? The day he was on that road to Damascus and that light shined on him and he saw Jesus. When he met Jesus, that's when he lost it all. Everything that he thought was accomplishments in his life, everything that he was dependent on to get him to heaven, he lost it all right then. But let me tell you something. Paul lost more than that. Stop thinking about it. He lost his prestige, didn't he? He lost his position because those people cast him out. They said, oh, he's one of them now. He lost that. He lost his position. He lost his respect. His family probably disowned him. He lost his money. He lost it all. Everything. He gave it all up for Jesus Christ. And he said, you know what? I'm glad I did. It'll give you a new perspective when you come to Christ. It'll also give you a new position. He was now in Christ. He didn't just know about Christ. He was in Christ, okay? And he wanted to serve Christ. You know, he, he lost his position. He got a new position, but he got a new perspective. And he says he wanted to be in Christ uh, in his position, but he also had a new passion, and that is he wanted to serve Christ. And how did he serve Christ? He served the church. Y'all knew this was coming. I hinted to it a while ago about getting people to come to church. You should have known it was coming. But listen to me. He had a passion for Jesus Christ. He wanted to be like Christ. And what does the Bible tell us about Christ? <coughs> that he loved the church and he gave himself for it. That's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to give himself to the church, and he did. He served the church for the rest of his life. People say, you know what? I, I, I'm dependent on Christ for my salvation. Well, that's good, because that's the only place salvation comes from. And they said, but I don't need the church. I beg you different. I beg you different. That ain't what Paul said. Paul didn't say that. Paul's whole life after he became a Christian was to serve the church. And what does God tell us about the church? What does Jesus say? He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. He did it for us, not for Him. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to glorify Him. But it wasn't for us that He wants us to go to church. It was, uh, I mean, it wasn't for Him that He wants us to go to church. It's for us. Because we need that fellowship. I got another quote that I, or another little thing I, I found that I want to read to you. I thought it was pretty good. This article called this person a church goer. Didn't call him a Christian. Called him a church goer. Okay? Y'all remember, I remember, some of y'all remember, when you used to have a newspaper delivered to the door and then, you know, you could subscribe to the paper. You can't get that anymore. But anyway, you, you, you subscribe. And, I, you know, when I was a kid, I'd look at the paper. I was looking at the funny paper. But, I, you know, but I still look at the paper. And then as I got a little older, I started, you know, looking at the sports section. I wanted to read about how the teams were doing. And then one day I read this letter to the editor and I thought, what in the world? People ain't got nothing better to do than do this thing. So this is about a letter to the editor, okay? It says, a churchgoer wrote a letter to the editor of the newspaper and complained that it made no sense to go to church every Sunday. Okay, now everybody in town used to read these letters. To the it's, uh, and this is a quote. He said, I've gone for 30 years now. And in that time I have heard something like 3,000 sermons. But for the life of me, I can't remember a single one of them. So I think I'm wasting my time. And you know what? Pastors are wasting theirs by preaching sermons at all. Well, you know what happens. Everybody else starts writing into the letter, you know, letters to the editor. And it says this started a real controversy in the letters to the editor column, much to the light of the editor. And it went on for weeks until someone wrote this. He said, I've been married for 30 years. <laughs> Here we go. He said, in that time, my wife has cooked 
some 32,000 meals. But for the life of me, I can't recall the entire menu for a single one of those meals. But I do know this. They all nourished me. And they gave me strength that I needed to do my work. And if my wife had not provided those meals for me, I would be physically dead today. Likewise, if I had not gone to church for nourishment, I'd be spiritually dead. The editor didn't like that one because it ended the debate. <laughs> Folks, listen. Do you have a passion for the things of Christ? It's not easy. It's not easy. Because if you have a passion for the things of Christ, you have a passion for God's church, meaning God's people. And sometimes that's not easy. Jerry and I <laughs> talked about this yesterday. You know, I asked a question in Sunday school this morning. Do you believe God puts people in the right place at the right time? But have you ever thought about yourself being, in, being the person that Jesus put in the right place at the right time? Have you ever thought about that? I never thought about it. I never thought that God was going to put me in the right place at the right time. For anything. I, I'm thinking, why me, Lord? I mean, Lord, there are other people out there more qualified. There are people that can do a better job. Why? Why me? And I just never thought that God would put me in a specific place at a specific time for a specific purpose. But thank God He doesn't use perfect people. He uses willing people. happened years ago. I'm going to try to make it quick. Try to get through it. I would cut up with my wife about teaching. I was teaching in high school about being And I could. And I was cutting up. Understand me, I was cutting up because I know we got a lot of school teaching. I said, why are you so tired? All you do is stand up there and talk to me. <laughs> Jim looked at me in Sunday school and said, you're still alive. <laughs> About a week later, she came home and said, all right, Mr. Tamari Pan, we need a Bible teacher at school. I told him you could. <laughs> so I started teaching Bible. My very first day in class, first day, I'm standing up there just talking about the Word of God, having a good time, explaining Scripture. There's one kid in that classroom sitting right back there, and that joker just kept talking and kept talking and kept talking, and it was very disruptive, and everybody's looking in and looking in. And you know, it's my first day. I didn't want to just hammer him and come down hard on the kid. What I really want to do is go over there and grab him and just tie a knot in. <laughs> but I guess the Lord got a hold of me and said, Don't do that. And so I just stopped what I was saying, and I was just standing there looking at him. And after a while, he looked up at me, and he said, what are you looking at? Now I really want to be his head. And I said, well, I'm looking at you. And he said, well, you've seen me. You can stop. Mm. And I waited a second, and I said, i tell you what, just stick around after class. Just just be Went on about class. Now, he didn't talk to more during class. And I thought, well, that's good. I forgot I'd even told him to stay. And after class was over, everybody was walking out, and I looked around, and he was sitting there. I went, oh, yeah. I'm to to and so I went over, and I sat down. And before I opened my mouth, he looked at me and said, Mr. Wilcox, I'm sorry. I was wrong. And it's no excuse, but I'm just really having a bad day. And I said, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. Is there anything I can do to help? He said, not really. He said, because the only man that really ever showed any interest in me at all got killed 
and I went to his funeral. Pull my heart. And I said, I am so sorry. I didn't know that. If I can do anything to help you, I said, tell me about your friend. We sit there talking to And I said, look, let's talk some more later. And we did. And you know that boy loves to go hunting and fishing. And his daddy, although he was a good man, just wasn't an outdoor him. So every time me and my boys would go hunting and fishing, I'd go get him. He'd go with us. Listen, having a passion for God's people, you know, what is easy. But what a blessing. Do you have a passion for Christ? Folks, to have that passion, you've got to declare the dependence. Today would be the day that we declare our dependence upon you. Lord, not just as a nation, but as people, as an individual, as men and women. Lord, may we be dependent on you every day. And may we declare that dependence every day. Because, Father, there is nothing in this life, nothing we've ever done. It doesn't have anything to do with who we are or where we are. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ and what we do with Him that makes the difference in our life. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that today everybody here is a Christian. But, Lord, if there's just one that's not, they've never come to you. I pray today, Lord, you would just speak to their heart. Lord, let them know that you love them and that you want, you desire for them to be in your kingdom. Lord, whatever it is that you want to do today, I pray that it would be done. For it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.